And we're live. We're live. The Technologist Podcast with Coach Dennis Thai. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the first podcast. I'm excited. <laughs> excited. This was actually much harder to set up than I initially thought it would be. But I like to think we're <laughs> resourceful technologists, so we figured it out. This is our first live podcast together. Um, this time without video because my internet's a bit slow, but hopefully we get we dive into some good content. Where are you right now? Where is I'm in, Slo so I'm in Slovakia right now, traveling mm -hmm. around. Left Berlin and now we are traveling Slo Slovenia, Slovakia, and going to Italy, and then I'll be returning back to Berlin. Just to help. Give some background to our listeners, to our viewers. Um, what's like a good elevator pitch for what it is you do, what it is you're like? What would you like people to know about Thai? I've done a lot in my life, but currently I focus just recently into going solo entrepreneur. And what I do is I help startups and corporates turn their idea into software that ships. And what I do is I provide technical leadership, I provide product design and near shoring expertise. This is something that I've built over the last couple of years and I'm really excited to test it out in the field. It, it sounds like near shoring of that description, near shoring is the term that people might be least familiar with. Could you shed some light on what near shoring is practically without Googling? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 having developers outside of your company, but somewhere near you in the same time zone, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like outsourcing to India. That's what traditionally people think when they think about you know nearshoring or like outsourcing. Here is basically you hire a company to do development work for you, but it's in the same time zone. And what does that look like for you? Like, what is what is somebody in your position who's managing nearshoring? What is your like a normal day in your life? Just so people can sort of empathize with what it is you do exactly. Well, per perhaps even more quite interesting is the landscape of post COVID, let's say web development that I've recently got into and familiarized with myself with, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got remote work that has really taken off. And you have, up until recently, a lot of interest in developing either in-house ideas that companies have, like, you know, MVPs, or they want to, uh, their old school industry, and they want to break out into the digital because they see, okay, innovation is slowing down. We are, you know, there's an end to our current business model because mm -hmm. we are producing, you know, physical goods and everything's going digital, electric cars are coming. So we need to innovate. We need to, this drive to innovate is really strong. Mm -hmm. So they want to build something. They want to build an MVP. They want to test and find their next business model that will take them. Let's say, say the company is a hundred years old, right? What's the, what's the product that can last us the next hundred years? And to do that, they usually don't have in-house expertise technology or expertise they, or techno product. exactly yeah they don't have the technology expertise in-house to digitalize because they come from a, from an old school background they have a lot of domain knowledge but they don't do software yet like that's one one type of client mm -hmm. the other are obviously startups that are you know thinking okay what kind of solution can we take and turn into software or how can we use software to support our business idea it, it sounds like you're talking about a startup that that, that, that lacks a uh, technology oriented co-founder or, or maybe it, it has a cheaper product but not a cto something like that yeah you from from a lot of startups that i've seen they focus mostly on product they don't have either ha even if they have somebody who does bring technological expertise they still need a team to execute. They need 
maybe the the CTO focuses on on one thing and they need a, a team to actually build the prototype, right? Mm -hmm. When, when without, you tell me without Sorry, go ahead so to, to keep the the red you know red string going uh i was talking about the landscape of of this kind of after covid mm -hmm. technology landscape and because of this drive to innovate and to build products there's a lot of companies that are offering this near shore extra hands on your project expertise, right? It's very easy to get talent. Uh, Ukraine was a big pool and still is. Then you've got Romania, you've got the Balkans, you've got North Africa, mm -hmm. Georgia are, are big centers from where this talent is coming from. And they're available to put on your project. But it, that's not very easy to do because what I've seen is that you can easily find developers, but just throwing people at the problem doesn't help you solve everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it, when you tell me you're doing near showing, so we're talking staff augmentation primarily, right? I mean, this is not some weird kind of or is it like tax optimization where you're selling where the product is no it's it's a cheaper salary for the dev it's actually it's, delivering the product it's staff augmentation like in the, the traditional sense right it's not something that i do directly but something that i've been involved with and now mm -hmm. that i have the experience of what does it mean to hire people near shore right Mm -hmm. and put them on a team i see a potential to offer that expertise on the market to companies who want to build something and need somebody to manage and to help facilitate that process because they like the expertise to hire us to vet and hire a studio or developers and just put them on a project and you know hope that magic will happen and they get what they want so let's say you hire a team of 10 people five people well, what are the biggest challenges for you from your from your perspective the biggest challenge is to keep so the biggest challenge is to keep this team on objective so that everyone knows what we are building and why we're building it mm -hmm. to keep the morale high so the team can adapt to changing requirements. Those are the things that you need to do in my role to keep cohesion, to keep, mm -hmm. keep the team moving forward and to actually deliver something that has use. Where I've seen it degenerate is where you don't have this technical leadership inside the team mm -hmm. and it degenerates to, you know, we're doing Scrum and we're using Jira and here are tasks and we have uh, somebody from product who's just delegating tasks to the offshoring developers they don't know why they're building something they just get tasks they deliver something badly because they don't know how does it fit into the the whole ecosystem mm -hmm. you know where, where, where does it plug in what exactly is the outcome that we're trying to achieve and then you know the time the deadline comes closer things are not working and you know the whole system breaks apart and this is something that I want to avoid because just having technical expertise on the project is not enough to actually deliver something that is useful to the client. For business outcome itself. Exactly. Okay. But, but it sounds like there's a constant looming threat that the team will lose cohesion. Yeah, it's... The, the threat comes from, you know, when you're talking about staff augmentation, you always have a clash of two cultures. And, uh, you know, nearshoring is easier to manage because the culture is, is different. When you, when you go, you know, the opposite far shoring, right? The classic outsourcing, India, Pakistan, the culture is so different that it makes it even harder to integrate these people and to keep them uh, Mm -hmm. on the same page it's not impossible of course it can be done but you just need to 
be aware of okay what are the you know how do we make sure that we are on point and all rowing in the same direction so that's it's, part, yeah it's very easy to silo and to create you know conway's law mm -hmm. uh, two silos and then jira becomes you know the oh. communication chat channel <laughs> the j between. word you mentioned the j word oh no exactly <laughs> we just lost all of our three viewers <laughs> <laughs> Are you using Scrum? Uh, yeah, we're doing Scrum. Yes, we're using Jira. Our I, I'm actually puts, having puts a, in requirements. <laughs> sorry for interrupting you. I'm actually having a, a talk about that next week with a fellow called Gordon uh, from Croatia, and we yeah. will open up that topic in 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 greater detail. Um, it sounds like uh, like. The primary concern is distance or, may, or maybe number of time zones of like the delta of time zones so you mentioned europe and india that's like like that that's let's say a hefty uh large enough distance to go from near shoring to far shoring but is west coast americas and europe is that near shoring or is that far shoring I, I wouldn't even focus on I think it's it's looking at, at the wrong problem if you say okay how far are or is it about econo we, ge economic ge geographically standards? no it's it's about you can have the same same company that has two divisions and one has a development team and the other is uh you know has let's say uh, another department that wants to build something you can have the same same mm -hmm. problem even though they're in the same building uh, because mm -hmm. you know just having technical expertise is not enough you need to manage communication flows you need to make sure that people are on point and this is this this is the hard thing in my opinion mm -hmm. and, and that uh, sounds really complicated like that management of the flow or even mapping out and creating the structure of communication between the people who are let's say part of the original organization which might be just the founders and whoever is augmenting and whoever is augmenting this week because the number of augmented augmented staff also changes over time i would assume yeah it seems it seems that it's rarely about the technology itself but mostly about people and relationships and about leadership and about how you structure the project you know are mm -hmm. are people empowered to actually act on their own based on an objective that they have without having to ask permission for everything that they need to do right that's but the ideal you know, setup yes that's the ideal setup but in order to that to do that you need to have a structure in place where first of all that's why i was talking about this team cohesion and making sure mm -hmm. that everyone is on the same page what's the objective what are we working towards because that's the baseline of without that is pulling you know and putting real effort and you know uh mm -hmm. taking decisions on their own but going in the wrong way they're going to do more damage than good right and in that kind of cases the temptation is okay let's micromanage everything and put everything into tasks and you know jira is king but if you so, yeah on that topic of jira and management and scrum and trust per se like you know like scrum like capital s scrum and capital a agile and you know cpi have this bad rap of being a command and control structure where mm -hmm. it's essentially a codified low trust or no trust environment meant to micromanage you from you know by remote control and that is happening in when managed badly or or maybe just unconsciously in like real life in office situations it sounds like this problem is even harder if part of the team is remote and then there's maybe more of a tendency to control more and to trust less what what are some tricks that you found that to, to build trust with a with a remote um near shore or staff augmented team there's three levels of difficulty. One is everyone sits in the level one, everyone sits in the same office. Level two, everyone's remote. And level three is you've got <laughs> a team sitting in the office and then you've got people who are remotely, right? And and one because... laptop that is the other five people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so 
it's usually in this kind of setups you have a hybrid setup where some people are going to the office and some people are joining uh remotely right and this is mm -hmm. the toughest nut to crack because they people working remotely need to feel like they're a part of the team they need to feel that they are the same project team you know if they, uh, you, you remember a story there on a project that I was working on, there was a team across multiple departments, right? And they created a project team. Mm -hmm. And I was- Like a task I force, came, with, but, but, exactly. but it's still all technology department, right? All technology department, yeah. but it was from different, you know, they had different, ma different line managers, but they were all assembled to work on uh, billing integration. Okay, so it's like a and, feature focused, silo inside the department yes and the problem was because there were three teams working on this project there was no clear leadership about okay who does who actually makes the the hard choices right i came onto the project and my toughest job was to convince everyone that they are on the same team that this mm -hmm. concept of they were like no no i'm on that team us team. versus them right is this your problem my problem yes mentality? yes you you are on that team but also for the duration of the project we just created a new team that's responsible for <laughs> delivering this project and that people's mind wait i can be on two teams at the same time yes it's <laughs> arbitrary it's a concept that we created we set the rules for engagement who's going to be you know who wants to take each key role in the leadership we had a quite fruitful discussion and then once everything clicked together and people had overcame this mental block of us versus them, mm -hmm. then things could have, you know, could start moving. So that sounds that creating a team sounds like it's synonymous with creating a new communication stream. You know, if we're talking just uh matchmaking and sort of dating within the team it's like hey i want you to meet that team you know, if if i'm thinking about it your context i assume is a company of maybe 20 50 people it depends because i've been i've been on big bigger teams as well where okay we were up to two, 200 people in the tech department like was it ever what i'm aiming at was it ever the case that the teams you're putting together and sort of introducing to each other was it ever the case that the team members did not know each other prior to being put on the team you know maybe it's a big company where nobody knows each other of course where, that, where, where that nobody happens, knows everybody that yeah. happens frequently and you know? sometimes we've got people working in the same company for years but they never touch uh, touch base until they're on some some project three years three years down the line and then you get brought on as an external technologist and then you introduce them to each other, even if they're augmented or from the same company and you manage that communication stream. Did I get that right? In, that could be one, one use case where my expertise could come in helpful, or helpful right? Where mm -hmm. somebody wants to build a cross-functional, you know, de deploy some software and they need to integrate it with different teams in the, in the project. How do you, how do you manage like imposter syndrome and people being like very you know like we have this what is it silent quitting a popular noun bbc where people only do that what is in their contract um and i've seen this a lot maybe not as dramatized or aggressive as it is now in the news um but i've seen a lot of you know where you get you put a, you take a good technologist and this can be and usually this is somebody who i know like you and i play the guitar you know we like music uh, you're very good at negotiating and you have very good people skills. And usually it's this, right? It's a sort of soft skill or a right-brained practice with a, a specialized technology um, passion. And usually people have to choose and then they get put in a box and it says uh, junior dev or it says senior dev or it says uh, mid-level or, or, you know, zero <laughs> zero seniority but uh you're a engineer in qa and then that box limits them in the decisions of they can do product 
but they are now no longer included in product discussions because their job title on the contract says engineering in test. And Sounds like that's that's your perspective client. Yes, so so that's that's the problem of putting the what's in the contract before identity, right? So, so if I if I take a, the human and say this person is capable of doing all of those things and the contract limited them. Now you come in and say, hey, there's a new team that we're putting together for this project. And you are now something else other than what you used to be. Uh, how do you, it sounds like that, that's an, that's a, that's an immediate source of conflict. Does that happen often in your, in your experience? What do you think? I think the contracts are more guidelines than general rules. Because yes, in the contract, it says you work on this position and there's some, some vague description of what your job title is and what your activities are. Mm -hmm. But usually there's a disclaimer that says, but if we need, find a need to transfer it to some other equivalent position, you will also do that job, right? So basically your full-time employment is just a framework. You get paid this much and basically we can you know kind of fit you in whatever box we want to put you in and, and the you know that and the ideal setup is that they have a high degree of autonomy right like like you said earlier exactly but it, it depends a lot on the personal traits of that person for example i'm very open and loose when it comes to rules and i can you know i I quickly jump into a role that some, that's left missing, and even though if it's not in my job description, I see oh, there's a there's a gap. Doing it, I'm gonna do it right. Like we, we, our listeners and viewers might not know this, but you and I work together across multiple companies uh, throughout. You know, our we, we've known each other now for what 15 years, give or take, 10 years. Yeah. Um, is it fair to say that you're comfortable with chaos, that you prefer less structure um, compared to more structure or even external structure? I thrive in an environment with, with less structure and so that I can get input of what somebody wants to have, like just the outcome and then you know figure out on my own how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. But there, you need to be aware that there are also people who prefer more structure. So it's always within a team, you know. Our culture seems to prefer extroverts. Our know. culture meaning? Meaning the, let's say, the Western culture in general. Okay. You know, uh, uh, rewards extroverted people who are early arisers, you know. And mm -hmm. if you are a late late riser introvert, you know, it's going to be a tougher time for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is why when, when we're talking about forming teams, you need to be aware of people are different. You know, there's autonomy is amazing, but only to some people who know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. For some and, other people. And for others, it's a burden. It sounds like for others, it's a burden. If you tell somebody who, who doesn't mm -hmm. crave autonomy, you tell them, you know, there's this project, here's the outcome, you know, make it happen. They just freeze and they mm -hmm. don't know what, what, what angle to attack it from, you know, and we're not talking even about seniority that or oh, senior people should know this. Now you can have a very senior person who is very good at tackling a specific problem. He's like a surgeon, right? But he mm -hmm. needs to know what he's operating on. If you mm. just tell him, here's a patient, you know, do your magic. Yes, but I'm a heart surgeon specialist. You know, why are you sending me somebody, you know, that that's not in my field? I, I'm glad that you expertise. mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's my, my first sort of gut feeling was that it, that has to do only with seniority and that, you know, giving somebody too much autonomy is like, you know, Throwing, throwing a junior who doesn't know how to swim into the water and it's like, okay, just 
let him figure it out. And then you're like 10 meters away where he cannot see you and you're just watching him to make sure he, you don't have to, you don't have to rescue him from the water, which could be, you know, a traumatic experience, let's say. And and I and I we we've, we've seen that equivalent in our careers where it's it's too much autonomy for somebody. But what does that look like, or at least how do you how do you measure it? Um, maybe um, let me rephrase that. There seems to be a spectrum of some people are bothered by too much autonomy and some people are bothered where their autonomy has a ceiling where it's being limited right so it's these two examples seem to be two two set to opposite extremes of the same spectrum so how do you determine where somebody is or whether where they are right now is transient you know are they headed somewhere is movement in both directions possible or is that a biological trait It seems that, you know, it seems possible to be, you're naturally probably going to be gravitated towards one side of the spectrum more than to the other. And you can learn to, you know, use the traits of the other. You can learn to be more spontaneous. You can learn to be more, you know, more autonomous as, you know, and that comes with seniority. So people who are junior and they need a lot of autonomy, they learn how to deal with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that they will be comfortable with it. So maybe they will do great work. If somebody else on the team takes this aspect of, you know, let's figure out what exactly we need to do and how to approach the problem. And then you have tactical specialists who are like, a, you know, who are like a sniper task force that you say, yeah. this is the path that we're taking, you know, and they're like laser focused. Okay we attack mm -hmm. and they're very good at what they do and once you have this kind of mix in the team where you know which people have what strengths and you are able to leverage each of them individually to to towards a common objective that's what makes a winning winning team a winning team so if i'm a let's say let's say i'm a startup that doesn't have a technical co-founder or i'm an established let's say branch manager in a big company and my particular branch is digitalizing something and i don't have i'm hiring the the top of the organization so the first technological um the first technologist in a pyramid is that your ideal client that's a client I can definitely help because Sounds like the, I missed the mark somewhere. It's it's I'm still narrowing down my ideal client. It's not that I this is something you know I'm new to the field. I'm new to to freelance and new to consulting. So this mm -hmm. is you know my first target. Let's say. So and that would be something what, like a fractional or full time CTO or or maybe even just VP of VPE. Um. So. Well, I see my role more as a, you know, a, a cross between a CTO and a CPO. So where I can take the technical, I can take the product requirements, the outcome, and then help with transforming that into the technology. Mm -hmm. But I leverage other people who are better at architecting to actually do technical architecture or, you know, uh, leverage my network to find hands-on developers who can actually code it. Mm -hmm. Because what I've seen very often is that either startups or established businesses are looking to establish a technology department. Mm -hmm. And because they want to hire one person to start with, they go like, they, they take the job description and say, this needs to be an amazing individual contributor. Who can do everything. Also <laughs> who will, who okay, will we have top and exactly <laughs> yeah. who will be hands-on program be excellent at what they do uh will have the technical leadership and the skills to to set up the company's technolo technology vision for mm -hmm. the next five years and also be able to grow the team from one to five people 
that's a unicorn I've mm -hmm. yet to see in such a person, right? Because yes, you can have a bit of both, but you and he needs to be cheap. And he needs to be cheap. <laughs> and start immediately. <laughs> exactly. And have 15 years so, of experience. <laughs> so that's 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 a nice wish list. And you know, okay. in the ideal world, yeah. you know, there would be many people who you can hire like that. But, but I've seen add... job descriptions like that. Like what you're picturing is not fantasy land. I've seen no, this is yeah, this is exactly the first hire that you know, non-technical so, people. So who should apply to those jobs? Like, you know, people like people who are looking for a job right now are probably self-censoring in, you know, it's like a crazy, it's like a crazy list of requirements. I'm self-censoring. I don't have all that. But if, if somebody is targeting or somebody like you or somebody who will work for you is targeting that kind of environment, that kind of position, how much of the requirements should they take seriously? Like How, how, do, how, do, how do I approach? Um, First of what, all, you what need to know. It seems that the requirements or the job ad is not a specification of work and the position that you will be required to do at this company. It's a wish list that somebody inside the company that posted the job description has. So wish list. And that that tells you a lot about oh about their their wishes, but not about their actual needs, because they maybe mm. maybe are not even aware of what they actually need. Maybe they just, you know, it's just like, oh, if only I had these 15 items in one person, then my problem would be solved, right? And you, as somebody applying for a job, you should screen the CV, like mm -hmm. the job, sorry, uh, the job posting, and identify. Okay, this is who, first of all who posted that. That's that's that gives you a lot of insight, right? What does that mean? Like HR versus CTO, or no, more... no. Even if it's HR, somebody gave them the requirements. So you uh -huh. know, is that a team lead? Is that the CTO himself? Is that a, a CPO? You know, is that whose wish uh, list is it? Who owns Whose the wish list? list is it? Yeah, is it a I technical see. wish the list? The human is behind it. Exactly. Because somebody who is more pro product product focused and they're hiring somebody who's going to be first in technology mm -hmm. will have a very different wish list than somebody who's in tech, mm -hmm. you know, and is hiring a senior React developer. Those will be less a wish list and more an actual, you know, this is what you will do. You know, it will be it will differ very little from what is posted there if somebody technical is looking for a technical position but when we're talking about you know this is a first time hire that will do the technical leadership and we want them to do uh, hands-on coding and be very pragmatic and uh, you know eventually grow the team mm -hmm. you take that you see okay it's a wish list and you try to find find out what exactly do they need what would be helpful to them and you know you try you go on the interview you try, you get as fast as possible the person who posted the job at and you ask a bunch of why white questions to understand mm -hmm. why they're posting this description why they need a person there and you try to match what you can provide to something on that wish list and it's important to know that in that case, the job that you end up landing might be completely different to the to the job ad that you posted, uh, that was posted. Because you can tailor it, you can find out what exactly do they need, and then you need to pitch how your expertise could help them on their objective. And maybe that will be a subset of their wish list, but you will be higher number one for that subset. And then there will be another job post added for people, you know, person number two. It's it sounds like this process requires a lot of negotiation skill. It's it's very yes, it's very negotiation heavy. So now but, that but, you're go, yeah, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. <laughs> no, um, you know the what, what's coming up to me is this idea of well, if you're consulting now, or whether 
you know, whether you, what, it, what it is you're doing is you're consulting in order to build an agency. And I have a lot of, a lot, a lot of people in my network who are on this bridge, right? Employment, consulting, agency. And then they're just spinning in loops, either in one direction or the other. Um, and I think, like, it sounds like there's a lot of legal and HR in your previous company. I don't know if there's anything we can publicly discuss, but I think you did this loop, right? Where it's like employment, agency, and now consulting. And maybe there, maybe there's directionality to this in the future. Um, is that fair to say about your situation? Yeah, I've done full-time employment for a product-focused big company, then went into an agency, and now I'm going freelance. So when you're doing that loop on the second, the second third of that, right, where it's employment agency consulting, when you're talking to your, let's say, a business or a company, let's be generic, let's simplify it. You're talking to an organization that you want to help. Are you approaching that as an employment prospecting work or is the prospecting work a sales conversation and how do you draw the line you know because with employment you know with it as a as a contractor as employee near showing this sort of hybrid freelance where you're sort of hired but you're not an employee but you're a contractor but you're not really a contractor contractor in the traditional sense you're just a remote engineer that does freelance work what, what, how do you draw the line of like am i gonna am i gonna respond to the job ad or am i hijacking that am i just doing it b2b how do you navigate the landscape and what is your advice for people who are may, maybe in this loop i'm gonna quote chris Voss here and say everything in life is a negotiation <laughs> and, you know when you say where do you draw the line everything is a sales negotiation even responding to a job ad with the intention of becoming a full-time employee that's a negotiation because you need to look at the requirement list distill the outcomes from it and sell yourself full-time in order to achieve the vision of the person who is hiring you the vision of the person or the vision of the company or the outcome of the company it I mean, sounds like that, that that sounds like an yes, important point that's easy to miss that's easy to miss because it's it's of course nuanced but uh if you get hired by person a and you fulfill the objective of the company you might get fired because you did the right thing yeah but uh, not, so not but not you know, according to them. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. your direct report is always, you know, the person who hired you, who has the most influence. And of oh. course, in an ideal setup that would align with the objectives of the company, but in the reward, it's sometimes not the case. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, we can talk about the ups and downs of full-time employment versus uh, you know, freelancing versus consulting versus different types of engagement. But to draw back to where you started, is it a negotiation? Yes. And we should be negotiating like we are doing a sales pitch also when we're full-time employees. I think that that's... Also, when we're full-time employees, are we talking internally exactly. or just for the job to get the job? Just inter internally, because it's very easy to, you know, put the negotiations on the back burner, mm -hmm. accept everything because you are a full-time employee. But that means that you get pushed around. It means that your existence at that company will be a pain. That's fascinating to treat the company environment like a negotiation constantly. My, my issue with that, or at least the conflict that I see a lot, I agree, but in practical terms, let's have a difficult conversation. Um, 
what I've seen with, let's say, Scrum and Waterfall, both, when they're done badly, what they limit first is that, I agree, it should be a negotiation, even when we're talking estimates. And when we're just talking- he, Just to come, come in here, because uh, maybe somebody is now, now thinking, probably thinking, oh my God, but if everything is a negotiation, then how can anything get done? How can we actually execute the vision when people are, you know, it's not about this divisive of, of, of you know, you give me work and I don't want to do that work. So let's negotiate and, you know, because that's, that's splitting the difference, right? Mm -hmm. Negotiation in a good sense of, <laughs> you know, uh, Let me let me put it oh, this way. Let's say making existence nice. great at the company. You caught up um, your connection. Did a little thing in the moment there. You do you mind re repeating your last sentence? I lost you, so I'll I'll give it back to you. Uh, so. I asked you about negotiation in the workplace, or, or rather uh, navigating the line between employment and consulting. And now it, these lines seem to blur where people are employing somebody, you know, that has his own legal entity, you know, in Romania, and it, they're sort of being hired by a German company, but they're not an employee, but they're not really freelancing. It's that's, something in between. That's just tax op optimization for the <laughs> relationship. <laughs> You know, so, the, the relationship um, is very similar to a full-time employee. There is similar, no difference. But there, what there's... is the difference for an organizational spectrum of negotiating? Let's say, here's our next here's our next goal. This is what we want to achieve. We decided you need to achieve this. With Scrum, Waterfall, etc., it seems like the thing that these systems are avoiding is they're taking away the power to say no. Where they're making it very difficult. They're making it very easy to manage dependencies or to remove the need to manage dependencies between people, between teams, between organizations, between departments. But they negate this aspect of saying no, where it is very difficult for an engineer to sit down at a meeting and say, we're not going to do this. We tried it. We're not going to do this. Or they agree to a deadline. They agree to, a, to an estimate. They agree to, a let's say, sprint. And then... Halfway to the sprint, they find something and they say, we will not deliver on this. Not because we don't want to, but because in order to achieve the outcome, we need to not deliver this and do something else. That seems to be an extremely rare and difficult thing to do. But that underlying ability to say no, at least you know we have the same negotiation mentors. And the mantra with Chris is, you can't negotiate if you can't say no. If the contract compels you to cooperate, how do you negotiate in such an environment where there is an implicit yes always? You know, it's like pseudo, like I don't want to, but pseudo, you know. How do you negotiate in such an environment? What advice would you give somebody who's stuck in that position? I mean, the key here is, you said it's implicit it's not explicit which means that it's up for negotiation right but the tricky thing is here you know i've also seen freelance workers caught in the same trap basically saying no is one of the scariest yeah. things in any situation so just being a freelancer you know mm -hmm. you might feel like contractually you have an option to say no but that would mean a loss your project might end you know you don't know if maybe you don't have another project scheduled so you feel compelled to go along with it so you have that option to okay i'm a freelancer i don't have a contractual obligation mm -hmm. but money is a strong motivator how I'm I'm not an expert in the international law, but it seems like these multi-country staff augmentation, you know, two intermediary agency setups, it sounds like these kinds of contracts would be very difficult to enforce, or at least practically 
nobody is suing each other. Like I, I don't see a lot of lawsuits happening. It seems to be 90% bullying. You know, it's like, well, you know, there is no fuck you pay me in the in the um how would you say uh in the freelancer but not full-time consultant employee side and the um let's say corporate or startup organization that hires somebody through an agency there doesn't seem to be a lot of i need you to do this in order for me to deliver and then they treat you know there seems to be a high degree of asymmetry in this kind of um setup whereas with a consultant i would assume you know some peer relationship with whoever hired you to have some level of authority um what's what's your take on this like how how often do people you hire for your client immediately uh um put themselves in a hierarchy beneath that client rather than working with them as a peer first to answer the question about contracts they seem to be unnecessary evil and they are usually used only as leverage when things go wrong and communication breaks down but contracts at the end will not save your projects they might just defend you know they just might lessen the loss that you incur when things go wrong so they're just insurance against the worst case scenario right mm -hmm. but even that even at that it's like a stop loss they not, like they do not guarantee success but if but something goes like, wrong it... it's like a it's like a stop loss feel overrun right <laughs> yeah but it does so, not get guarantee success like having exactly a contract it's... that enforces communication and trust does has zero like is it zero or is it does it have any benefit if you ask me i would prefer to vet people and establish trust than rely on a legal My document opinion. with questionable enforceability through a legal system that barely works especially so that, across countries and how do you build trust remotely with a contractor as employee setup a quick answer because i i would i would prefer you answer to follow up on that on the more complex question i asked earlier that's the key challenge and i've seen a company that uh, that approached me and said hey you know we we're willing to do a small test project for you uh free of charge so that you see how the relationships works and if you're happy with us we're glad we'll, we'll gladly continue i think that's those are the ones that stand out but I if mean, it's small it, low stakes it, and free is that a difficult enough environment to build trust that's something that caught my eye but then when you think about it is you know i didn't respond to that message huh. they did stand out though but how do you measure trust in anything right mm. you there's no easy way to go about it you basically need to test it out you can look at you, you know obviously you do the I look at the website is the website there is it legit does it have all the you know all, all is there a legal entity behind it uh how are they communicating are they usually i go on a call as soon as possible after you know checking the website and getting a general impression of the work that they they've showcased and i have a conversation with them and trying to see are they trying to understand my problem and come up with a solution mm -hmm. or are they selling me something that i don't need right that's but, but that sounds like you're doing that for yourself for your own peace of mind for your own certainty yes and you might still get screwed it in the end so there's no sil silver bullet mm -hmm. it's it's very touchy-feely and uh 
at the end, that's why the network of people that you worked with in the past who are reliable is so valuable. It's really hard to build, but once you have it, that's one of the key assets that you can have. So social proof, your references, your network, etc. So building a brand as rather than a career. Yes. So social proof, but not just social proof, also connections. For example, you know, we, of course, if you that's need, why people go to Ivy League colleges, etc. If you need, if you need a backend developer, and you know five people who you've worked on with in the past, who know who you know that you, they can deliver what the what mm -hmm. you agree, you know that's that's value, and that's hard too because you need to constantly. And that's not in the job in description. Usually that, that, that quality you just mentioned, being able to deliver reliably and to be <laughs> enjoyable to work with them, that's usually not in the job description and it's not in CVs, but it is on many sales pages for people who market themselves as a brand. Well, oh, that's why, that's why it's hard, hard to hire external people because you don't know who you're going to get with. And usually you the references and CV are usually not enough to tell you mm -hmm. how a person will behave in a high stress situation on a project, right? You need mm -hmm. to, you need to test it out and you see, you know, and then you build a pool of core people that you can trust and bring on the project when you need them. Do you mind if we double back on the previous topic? There's a part of that question that I asked you about that I'm curious on, on the sure, hierarchy. Just just a heads up i have six more minutes and so we should be wrapping okay. up slowly last question and then we can wrap up so the hierarchy on you know you're hiring somebody are they you know in a way submissive to the client through you or are they you know equal peers as contractors what's usually your hierarchy setup and how, and is that intentional or accidental or unconscious here the tricky thing is if you are hiring somebody the relationship needs to be clear so for example if i hire somebody then they work for me and mm -hmm. i i provide a value i'm the translation layer to provide the value You're if the i hire somebody yeah. if i hire somebody and they this somebody works directly for the client then the client should be paying them directly and I'll collect a fee for mm. finding them or managing them. Mm. Because where things break down is when you put somebody on the team who will work directly for the client, but they're getting paid by you, then you have a conflict of interest because mm. this person can be directly reached by the client, but they have no power to negotiate because the contract is with you. So, you know, this kind of triangle setups are really bad for business see that's why you're an expert on this because that that nuance is not obvious to an outside observer that nuance is not of the relationship itself and payment is not obvious and it wasn't even obvious to me that that let's say that there was a uh, cost benefit analysis to be done on you know should be set it up like this should be paid the should we play should we pay the agency or fractional cto and then he hires or should we assume that this is an employee and then we hire and then he just consults? This really depends on the project, but it's always like, in some cases, it would make sense that, you know, let's say I get hired to deliver a specific project, but I need a team to do it. Mm -hmm. If I'm translating all the requirements, then I'll put the whole team on my payroll and I'll just deliver the outcome, right? Yeah. But if they, we are, for example, integrating those people into an existing team, then I'll put them straight on the, onto their payroll so that they can negotiate directly with the client and I'll provide just a service. Uh, you know, if I found them, we can discuss like a management fee or a finder's fee or mm -hmm. somehow, but it's really important, the transparency of relationships, because in the work, you know, I, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm hiring these people, not disclosing the salary and then, you know, reselling them, them for, forward. 
Mm. Then the client wants something from them directly and they're in no position to negotiate. And then they figure out, oh, they're super cheap. Why am I paying so much to you to (laughs) have Zoom? Exactly. And that's (laughs) exactly and that's that's where the, the system can easily break down. So transparency is key. Uh, that builds builds trust and makes everyone, uh, you know, trust each other. Know mm-hmm. that they can negotiate for themselves. Gives them the right amount, the good kind of aut- aut- autonomy. And I think that's the way to set up okay. these kind of structures. Okay, Dai, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for thank you, Dennis. Time. This was amazing. That's a wrap. Okay. (laughs) End stream. Thank you. Next time with video.